doing today? Yes. Uh, welcome to everybody who's watching online, our Refuge Campus, Perigold Campus. This is the kickoff of our Global Impact uh, Mission Conference. As, as you see, I'm a guest speaker this morning. My name is David Potier. I'm the senior pastor of La Chapelle, a French-speaking church in the heart of the most secular, unreached city in North America, Montreal. In Montreal, we have less of a half percent of people that are evangelical Christian. This is similar to some close Muslim country. It's one of the hardest ground in the world. But in the last few years, we begin to saw things we haven't seen before. We baptized in the last four years 500 people. Maybe it's not much here, but let me tell you, for us, this is big. We can applaud for that, yes? Uh, this is my family on the screen. Uh, my wife Karen, we're married for 21 years. Don't, don't, don't get worried. I didn't marry at 10 years old, okay? I look uh, younger than what I am. And there's my children, Anthony, Zach, Leah, and Naya. And before we uh, go in the sermon, I want to thank Pastor Archie and Pastor Eric Brown for welcoming me here today. This is really great church. I love, I love this church. You have a great church, great pastor. Can we clap church for your pastor, Pastor Archie Mason? Come on church. Come on, you can do better than that. Come on. Clap for your pastor. I want to speak this morning on a subject that in my opinion is the fuel of missions. In fact, is the fuel of your mission and the fuel of all authentic Christian life. I want to speak about prayer. Impossible prayer. Let me ask you this morning, what kind of prayers do you pray? Do you pray small, safe, things that are going to happen anyway? Things like, please God, heal me from my cold. Of course, in a few days you're going to get better, it's just a little cold. Or things like, please God, give us a safe trip. Now, that's not a hard one for God. Buckle up, you know, drive slowly, and it's going to happen, right? So I'm wondering if sometimes we pray to God and God is like, that's it? <laughs> that's all you got for me? I'm God. Ask for big things. Ask me for impossible things. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying we should not pray for small things. God is a good father. He wants to be involved in the small things of our lives. But we are also called to pray for big things, to ask for impossible things. Now, some will say, why asking God if he already knows everything? I don't understand all the mystery of prayers. But here's what I know. In the Lord's Prayer, Jesus taught us how to pray. And he said this, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So in heaven, everything that happens is the will of God. But not here on earth. God is looking for somebody to partner with. God is looking for a partner that will pray his will, according to his will, so that his will will be done on earth as it is in heaven. It's not that God needed to work that way. It's that God chose to work that way. Everything God does except the work of the creation, he did it through a man. Even the redemption, he did it through a man, Jesus Christ, the man. So maybe that's why the apostle James said, you do not have because you do not ask. Because in God's economy, things are not just happening. People think, if it's God's will, it's going to happen. No. God is looking for somebody to partner with so that his will will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Now, to pray big prayers, to pray impossible prayers, you need to pray with faith. But what is faith? 
What is praying by faith? We're going to look at three principles today to pray impossible prayers. And the first principle is in Acts chapter 4. But before we read the text, let me give you a bit of context. Uh, Peter and John, the apostles, are going to the temple here. And they, there is a lame beggar at the gate. And he wanted money from them. So Peter said, silver and gold I do not have, but what I do have, I give it to you in the name of Jesus of Nazareth. Walk. And the guy was healed. But the religious leaders got upset and they threatened them to speak no longer to anyone in Jesus' name and they let them go. So Peter and John went back to the church and they reported how the religious leaders threatened them and they all called a prayer meeting. And we have the record of this prayer meeting in Acts 4, 24. We read this. When they heard this, they raised their voices together in prayer to God. Sovereign Lord, they said, you made the heavens and the earth and the sea and everything in them. You spoke by your Holy Spirit through the mouth of your servant, our father David. Why do the nation rage and the people plot in vain? The kings of the earth rise up and the rulers bend together against the Lord and against his anointed one. Now, Lord, consider their threats and enable your servants to speak your word with great boldness. Stretch out your hand to heal and perform signs and wonder through the name of your holy servant Jesus, verse 31, after they prayed, the place where they were meeting was shaken and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke the word of God boldly. Three principles to pray impossible prayer. And the first principle is in verse 25 and it's this, pray with scriptures. Don't pray only random prayer. Use the Bible to pray. That's the first thing they did. They begin their prayer by quoting the Psalms. When you pray with scriptures, when we pray based upon the word of God, it gives you confidence and authority in your prayer. In Daniel chapter 9, the prophet Daniel found in scriptures that the length of the exile in Babylon was prophesied to be 70 years long. And this time was over, but Israel was still in captivity. Why? Here's why. God was waiting for somebody to pray his will so that his will will be done honored as it is in heaven. So Daniel began to pray for three weeks according to the word of God. And the word of God gave him confidence and boldness. In Romans 10, the apostle Paul said this, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So, Praying with the scriptures increase our faith. When I was a youth pastor, I made my first ministry trip to the U.S. I was young, and I had booked an hotel room. And arrived at the front desk, I asked for my room, and the lady said, Sir, uh, she didn't say sir, nobody called me sir, everybody called me young man. Young man, uh, we don't have any reservation at your name. I said, hey, I booked it with my credit card. She said, we don't have anything. She said, sir, do you have? A confirmation number. And I was young and stupid, so I asked, what, what, what is <laughs> a confirmation number? And that day I discovered that a confirmation number is a number that confirms your reservation. <laughs> and I learned the lesson painfully because I had to pay for my room a second time. Now, fast forward a couple of years later, I'm in Quebec City for family vacation. I booked an hotel room, arrived at the front desk. She said, young man, we don't have any reservation at your name. But this time, you know what? <laughs> I said, oh, no. I have <laughs> a confirmation number that confirms that in this hotel, there is a room for me. So I don't care, madam, if you're going to have to kick somebody out of here. <laughs> I don't care if you're going to have to build a room for me with your hands. There is a room in your hotel for me. Even if I don't see it, even if I never went in it, I have the evidence, the confidence, the assurance, the faith that in your hotel, there is a room for the Potier family. Can I get a witness this morning? You know why I was so bold this time? Because I had a confirmation number. You know what, friends? We have 
a confirmation number. The word of God is my confirmation number. The promises of God are true and real. Can I hear amen this morning in the church? Come on. Can we clap for the word of God? Come on. Clap for the word of God. But here's what the enemy does. He tried to lie to you. He's aggressive on makes you believe that this is not true. And it happened to me sometimes. But when it happens, you know what I do? Talk to the hand. <laughs> Talk to the hand. I will believe the word of God. Amen? So I don't know what you're going through. But you have a confirmation number. If you don't know how you're going to feed your kids next month, you have a confirmation number. My God will meet all my needs according to the riches of his glory. If you're afflicted, some people are afflicted in pain this morning. You're not alone. You have a confirmation number, 1 Corinthians. Praise be to God, the Father of all compassion, who comforts us in all our affliction. Some people are tired here this morning. Some people are lacking strength. Some people are depressed. You have a confirmation number, Isaiah 40. But those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. You have a confirmation number. If you find out that your prayer life is weak, ask yourself, on what base do you pray? If you only pray random prayers, that's not bad. But you will not pray impossible prayers without the Word of God. You need to pray with Scripture. Secondly, you need to pray with perseverance. In Matthew 17, uh, some Jesus' disciples tried to cast an evil spirit and they couldn't. So they went back to Jesus and asked him what happened. And look what he tells them in Matthew 17. Because of your little faith, for truly I say to you, if you have faith, like a grain of mustard seed, you will say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it will move. And nothing would be impossible for you. You know, when the Bible speaks about faith and mustard seed, uh, usually we think about smallness. Just take a small faith to, to pray, to, to move mountains. But I think there's another reason why Jesus used the metaphor of the mustard seed. Listen to what Pliny the Elder said, a Roman naturalist of the first century. Mustard, he said, when it has once been sown, it is scarcely possible to get the place free of it. As the seed, when it falls, germinate at once. Did you hear that? Did you get that? Mustard is a persistent seed. Mustard is a perseverant seed. And when you sow mustard in your garden, you need to take care. Because if you don't, it will outgrow everything else. In other words, my friends, the mustard never give up. <laughs> Where are the mustard people this morning? Where are the faith people this morning? There's somebody here to say, I will believe God, I will continue to pray again and again and again for big things. Ask God big things. He's a big God and he wants you to ask big things. Can we clap for Jesus this morning in the house of the Lord? <laughs> clap for Jesus. Those of you who are familiar with Jesus' stories, you know this story of, about uh, the parable of the persistent widow. It was taught to teach us, keep praying, keep praying, keep praying. Okay, that was the purpose. Now, at the end of the story, Jesus closed in a weird way. And I never understood it before. Here's how he closed the story. When the, man of, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? What? Jesus is saying here, those who continue to pray, those who persevere in prayer are those who have faith. In fact, when we stop praying, it's a sign of unbelief. When we have faith, we pray. And uh, my parents were those kind of 
perseverant prayer warriors. My dad is with the Lord right now. My mom's still alive. She's 84, 84 years old. She had me. She was 42 years old. I was kind of a surprise, you know. <laughs> my dad said, no, you weren't. I said, yes, I was. I was. <laughs> and uh, my, my parents were such prayer warriors. Uh, they pray almost all their lives for one thing. They wanted to see revival in our city. And for 40 years, they attend every prayer meeting, and they saw almost nothing. But you know what? Five years ago, things begin to change. We had a growth was so fast. We, we grew from a core group to 1,600 people in less than five years. After one year, we add a second service. After two years, we were full again, we add a second church. After four years, we were full again everywhere, we add a third church. And now we have a fourth church in the oven. And God is doing things in the hardest place in North America, one of the hardest in the world. When I talk to church planner on the West Coast in California, they say, hey, David, we have a hard ground. I said, yes, you have. They said, planning a church in California is like planning a church in Sodom and Gomorrah. And I said, you're right, brother. You're right. But you know what? Planning a church in Montreal is like planning a church in front of the gates of hell. <laughs> but you know what Jesus said about the gates of hell? That they shall not prevail against his church. Jesus is building his church in Montreal, in Arkansas, in Jonesboro, and to the ends of the earth. Can we clap for Jesus this morning who built his church? So part of our vision is to plant 20 churches in Montreal, 30 churches in Quebec, and 50 churches where somebody speaks French. Uh, we want to plant in France, Belgium, Switzerland, French-speaking uh, African country. God is moving in an unprecedented way, and we think we are at the point of a, a, a turning point for French-speaking people in all the world. We believe that. But what changed? What, what changed from really hard, really hard to this harvest. Here's what I think changed everything. You with me? I think we are reaping the results of my parents' prayer. I think there was no prayer wasted. That God was behind the scenes answering all those prayers. I think we are dwarfs, I'm a dwarf, sitting on the shoulders of those prayer giants that preceded us, and we are reaping where we didn't sow. No prayer is wasted if you love the Lord. You know, your job is to love the Lord and to pray. And his job is to do the rest. So love the Lord with all your heart and pray continuously and be close to him and God will do the rest. That's your part. The other part is his. He is the God of the impossible. If you want to pray big prayers, pray with scriptures, pray with perseverance. And I close with that, pray with passion. James 5, the effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. James say, pray with passion. Don't pray those religious prayers that you don't really mean. Pray like you mean it. And when somebody pray like he mean it, God is listening that. God is not listening religious prayers. God is not listening prayers that don't come from the heart. But God will listen to anybody. Anybody who's crying out to him with a full heart. And you know what? Praying with passion is not what we do typically. <laughs> I discovered what praying passion was when I was 15 years old. I grew up Baptist. Uh, is there some people that grew up Baptist here? I mean, almost everyone. Come on. Are you, are you, sh are you ashamed to be a Baptist? Come on. If you grew up Baptist, come on. Raise your hand. All right. Almost everybody. I grew up Baptist. And, uh, you know, by the way, uh, if you're new here, you need to know this. You don't have to be a Baptist to go to heaven. Amen? But why take a chance, folks? Why take a chance? <laughs> Come on! <laughs> so I grew up Baptist, and, uh, 
You know, if you, if you did that, we Baptists can make prayer so boring, prayer meetings so boring that even the angels don't want to attend the prayer meeting. Amen? But when I was 15 years old, I attended a different kind of prayer meeting. Uh, it was a bunch of grandmas. And I never saw that before. Those grandma were really praying passionately. And when it began, some were crying, some were kneeling, some were lying on the floor, crying like babies, praying for people they don't even know. And I was like, can we do that? It is, it is kind of chaos. I mean, is the Holy Spirit will be offended by this weird kind of prayer? We know we Baptists pray in circles and one, two, three, four, five. And you pray, you, you, you're, when you're the last one is just terrible. You don't know what to say. Everybody said everything. So you just said, thank you, Jesus, for the day and for the meal. And uh, you just don't know what to pray. But those ladies was praying like different, you know. And I was impacted by them. And I try to apply that in my own life and ministry. So when we started our church, before we started it in, in 2013, I did a 10-day fast and prayer. And during that time, I was supposed to, I, I met with a lady that was supposed to help me find a location for our church. We were looking for 400 seats, okay. And this is not common in our context. So I, I, I met that lady and I said, Madam, we are looking for 400 seats to, to, to plan a church. And she looked at me and said, why? I said, because um, we think we're going to need 400 seats. And she looked at me and said, why? I said, because we prayed, we fast, and we have this uh, conviction that we need 400 seats. And she looked at me again and said, why? I said, ma'am, you don't understand. She said, no, young man, you don't understand. Did you know that the average church in Montreal, in Montreal is 42 people? I said, yes, madam, I know, but can you help me find a 400 seats location? She said, I can't, I just can't. I said, all right, God will help me. So we finally find a place, 465 seats, and the day of the launch, we were nervous, uh, but people were saying, some people were saying, that's not gonna, be, that's not gonna work. You should took a smaller venue, that's not gonna work. But the day of the launch, we had no seat empty. People were sitting on the floor. The day of the launch, we launched with 535 people. Maybe it's not big here, but I tell you, for us, this is unprecedented. But you see, my prayers of passion plus my parents' prayers of passion was producing fruit. I close with this. It's a story more than, no, it's not a story, it's a testimony. This is going to wrap up all my sermon this morning. I have an older brother. He was raised in church, uh, but at age 18, he became rebellious and uh, he left home. He began to live his own life, drinking, partying, uh, spending money, drugs and girls and, and everything. And he was for many years what we call a, a, a prodigal son. But my mom was praying for him. She found that in scriptures, Proverbs 22, start children of the way they should go. And even when they are old, they will not turn from it. So my mom began to pray with scriptures based upon scriptures. And she prayed and prayed, but nothing seems to happen. At one point, we were six months without a news. Can you imagine that? You have an 18-year-old kid, six months. You don't know where he is. You don't know if he's dead somewhere. In those days, we didn't have Facebook. We didn't, have, we didn't know anything. So one night, my mom was so anxious, she couldn't sleep. So she woke up my dad and said, we need to pray for our son. Six months without news. What's happening? Is he dead? We just don't know. And uh, my dad just said, that's true. You're right. We, we need to pray. We, we need some help on this. So they kneel down beside the bed and they begin to pray to God. Oh, Lord, have mercy on us. Lord, you see our son. You see how he destroyed himself. 
how he's far away, away from you. And they ask for God's favor and they ask for God's mercy on, on my brother. And uh, with 10 minutes of prayer and 15 minutes of prayer, once the peace of God just came in the room. And they closed their prayer with this. They said, Lord, this is awesome. Don't miss that. They closed their prayer by saying, Lord, can you just give us a sign? We want to know if he's alive. Amen. And they went back to bed. When they put, I'm not lying to you, when they put their heads on the pillows, the phone rang. You know who it was? The police. <laughs> Mr. Potier, this is the police. Yeah. Do you have a son called so and so? Yeah. What he did? <laughs> Sir, don't worry, he did nothing. We just uh, caught him, uh, 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 and we, we want to ch check if the car he drives is his car. Because we thought he's pretty young to drive a big car like that. Do you confirm it is his car? My dad said, yeah, yeah, yeah. It is his car. It's not a steel car. No problem. So the officer said, sir, I'm so sorry I woke you up. And my dad said, sir, thank you so much for waking us up. We were not sleeping anyway. And he said to the officer, officer, tell my son to come visit us. It's been six months. We had no news from him. So my brother heard that on the phone and he said, yeah, yeah, dad, I'm going to go, I'm going to go. But months and months after, he did not go. He did not come. But one day, he arrived at home. Surprise, he came. And um, again, like it used to, he fought with my parents. It did not get well at all. So after a talk, by the way, my dad had the brilliant idea to take the Bible. And he said, I'm going to read you something, son. So he, <laughs> he read to him Proverbs 5, 6, and 7 on the son who shamed his mother. <laughs> it didn't happen well at all. <laughs> so my brother decided, he said, are you done? He said, I'm done. All right, I'm leaving. So he decided to left. He went outside and jumped in his car and tried to start his car. But you know, up in Montreal in winter, it's like cold, okay? You don't know what it is to be cold. It was so freaking cold. It was like minus a thousand degrees. We were like frozen. So my brother tried to start his car, but the car didn't start. It was like, you know that. <laughs> and after one minute at minus a thousand, it was like, so he got mad, he came back in the house and said to my dad, my battery's dead, I need to call the garage. But my dad had a word of faith. He said, no, you're not going to call the garage. You're going to go back in your car and you're going to start your car again. But this time your car will start, and he said this, but this is going to be a sign from God that you're still a child of God and that you need to come back to the Lord and that you need to come back home. Go start your car. My brother didn't think it was a good idea. He didn't want it to do it. But my dad, he's six foot three, 250 pounds. So he said, and he had this loud voice in the choir, <laughs> loud voice. He said, you're going to go start your car. <laughs> and my brother said, all right, all right, all right, all right. <laughs> went outside. But this time, my dad went with him. And he, he jumped in the car. And my dad was in front of the car waiting like that. He put the key in the contact, but before he turned it, he did that. So my dad looked at him and he did. <laughs> you know what it means? Same in French and English, okay? <laughs> Crazy old man. <laughs> That's not going to work. So he turned the key. But when he turned the key, the car didn't start. The car started so strongly 
it was almost an explosion. It was like, <laughs> and my brother was like that. <laughs> and my dad in front of the car was like that. <laughs> he got mad. He left. We thought, ah, oh, nothing's going to happen. With this sign from heaven, he still have a hard heart. But you know what? There was a seed planted in him before, but that time, that moment was something happened. A couple months later, we had a call. Mom, Dad, it's me. I have good news. I've met some Christian friends. I've been back to church. I will be baptized next month. And by the way, I find a girl and I want to marry that girl. Dad, mom, would you come at my baptism next month? Mom, dad, I'm back to the Lord. I am back home. This is not a story. This is our testimony, how God can pull with his love somebody who's so far away from him, who, who's mad against God, and bring him back in his arms of love. I don't know if somebody's far away from God today, but did you know how he's waiting for you? Patiently, lovingly, he will not reject you if you go to him. No matter what you did, if you go to him with repentance, he will not reject you. Did you know how much God is waiting for you? Some of you, you don't go to church. I'm not a religious person. God is waiting for you. Some of you are so religious, I mean, your, your imprint is in the pews of the church, but you're far away from him. God is waiting for you. God is a loving father who's waiting for you. If your heart is not full to him, he's waiting for you. And I can tell you how much time in my life I was so far away from him. Sometimes I was in the pew, sometimes I was at the party, sometimes I was preaching. But he's a good dad that welcomes us and wants us. Go back to God. Go back to the Lord. He wants you. And you're here this morning to give again your whole heart and whole life to him. If you believe what I said is true, can you just clap for somebody who needs to believe it this morning? Can you clap with me? Somebody needs to believe that. So I don't know what your mountain is. Some, of, some people here are so discouraged, that's your mountain. Depressed, that's your mountain. Your plans didn't happen how you thought it was. You had your career plan, you had your plan with your girlfriend, and she left you. You have your plans for your business, didn't happen. I don't know what your mountain is, but keep praying, keep asking, keep knocking. Don't settle for small prayers. Ask God, big prayers, because you know what? Sometimes we pray safe. Because we, because we want to preserve God's reputation. But in fact, it's not God's reputation we want to protect. It's ours. Pray big. Pray big prayers. Impossible prayers. Because everything we ask in faith, according to his will, he will answer us. Amen? Don't settle for small prayers. 
Pray big prayers. Keep going. Keep praying. You're going to see the glory of the Lord. Can we close our eyes? I will close in prayer, please. Lord Jesus, thank you so much that you are the one that's supporting us in prayer. I pray for every person here. I pray that they will be strengthened in their prayer, that they will not settle for small prayers, that they will pray with scriptures, with perseverance, with passion. I pray that you will come with your loving, loving hands, loving arms, and strengthen them today in the name of King Jesus. And the church say, Amen.